in the comments below. Look at that thing! Tonight we got something good, but we have something even better because I'm going to be talking about my three favorite books on positive mindset. My next question for you is on a scale of one to 10, how do you feel today? This is a question I asked my team about a week after we all were in the middle of coronavirus and I asked them and on average, the number had gone down two. So I say on average, my team usually rates about seven to eight, numbers were five to six. It was a very marked difference. How are you guys feeling? After a few weeks, that number had gone back up. And what I wanna talk about tonight is a positive mindset, specifically three books, and what they have meant to me, what I took away from them. So we're gonna talk about that. We have a bunch of questions that came in via Instagram, questions about how has positive mindset affected my income? Uh, how do you do it if you have negative people around you? So we're gonna talk about all those things. Prepare your questions or not. I've already got amazing questions, thanks to Cass. Cass heard my rant yesterday about uh, the horrible questions that the IWT community has been submitting. Cass, what'd you do to get these good questions tonight? Uh, we asked like three hours ago to submit the questions, so I think that helped, and also via Instagram, not a survey. Very proud, Cass, and also thankful that we have good questions. Yeah, we got some good questions. All right, so my first book that I would like to recommend that was awesome, is a book called Playing Big by Tara Moore. None of these authors know that I'm about to plug their book, but I really love these books. Um, so <laughs> I found out about this book by stumbling across an article on Goop, of all places, okay? Now, usually I don't read quack sites, but this article was amazing. And it was an excerpt from the book or a Q&A by the author. I was like, damn, this is good. Bought the book immediately. As you recall, I have something called Ramit's book buying rule. If I see a book that even remotely looks interesting, buy it. Never question it, never hesitate, never equivocate, just buy it. And I finally got around to reading it and I loved it. Uh, so first off, a few things that stood out to me. Uh, Tara does an amazing job at helping us identify the stories that we tell ourselves. Right? What are some of the stories that you tell yourself? Um, could it be, I'm not good at making money. I'm not a morning person. I'm not the kind of person who can lose weight. Uh, what else are some stories that we tell ourselves? Uh, I can't earn more money. I can't earn more. I can't start a business. Uh, I can't find love. Yep. That's a mm -hmm. really common one. Uh, I'm not good at public speaking. Mm -hmm. You're probably not if you say that, but you can become good. All right. So, um, I like, I, I love this concept of narratives and the stories we tell ourselves. I used to say I'm a skinny Indian guy and I realized in my mid twenties, that was just a story I was telling myself. And that really opened my eyes to all the things I could possibly change. So she talks about that. Um, she really talks about the concept of playing small. And I want to spend a second on this. And then I'm going to talk about how it's related to positivity. How many of us have played small at one point or another in our lives? And how many of us maybe are playing small right now? What do I mean by playing small? I mean that we are not going for truly what we want, because what would people think if I fail? Uh, we are telling ourselves, I need a credential before I can do that. I need to read more. I need to figure it out. How many people here are doing that? Lots. We're playing small because if we actually articulate out loud what we want, people might laugh. We might not get it. And worst of all, we will come back and be in the same place and what will people think? So we play small. And Tara just really profoundly illustrates this. And um, she talks about, you know, I need to take another 10 classes, I need a PhD. And I thought, wow, she really nailed that concept of playing small. And of course the book is called Playing Big, so it's really about being confident. Even if you don't necessarily have the skills yet, it's saying, this is what I want to achieve. Now let me make a plan to get it. And I just love that concept. 
concept. Um, one other thing is she talks about a future version of yourself. How many of us have ever thought about what we want ourselves to be like in 10 years? I didn't, but I think it's a powerful concept. And if you think what, you know, if you even spend the time right now to write down a half page of what are you, what do you do, what do you look like, where do you live, who comes to you for advice, where do you eat dinner on a Friday night, write that down and you might be surprised because often we have these lofty goals for I've run a marathon, I've done this, I donate to charity, but then you ask yourself, what am I doing today to possibly be moving towards that? And she really has this beautiful concept of, I think she calls it a future mentor, uh, of asking yourself, who do you wanna be and then starting to work towards it. Playing Big is written for women, but I found it immensely useful. And I think that everyone, man or woman, uh, would read this and find it incredibly useful. Uh, and also, I recommended this cast to you. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your experience with this book? Yeah, I thought it was amazing. And I read the book. Uh, I really like the part about the inner critic and the inner uh, mentor. And she says in the book not to um, like feel bad when your inner critic comes up, but just to like recognize it and embrace it and like move on from it, which I thought was really powerful because I think a lot of people just feel bad when it comes up, those feelings come up. Um, so yeah, I thought the book was awesome. And then she actually has an online course that I enrolled in after which was great too. A funny story about that, I still remember. Mm -hmm. You, that was the first course I think you had ever taken. Yeah. And you came to me, you're like, do you think I should join her course? And I'm like, yeah. If you like her book, get the course. Yeah. And I didn't even, like, we didn't even talk about how much it cost. It was uh -huh. just like, yes, if you find an author you like, find a way to get everything they have. Yeah. And I've done that with authors and mentors of mine where I found somebody who truly transformed my life and I got their courses, I got all their other books, I hired them to be a consultant. Mm -hmm. But funny story about that is you had missed the deadline. Oh really, I don't remember this. Yeah, <laughs> you missed the deadline uh -huh. and you were like kind of down because uh -huh. you had gotten really pumped up. Uh -huh. And I don't know if I suggested it or you came up with the idea on your own. Either way, you emailed her and uh -huh. said, I just read your book, I know I missed the deadline by a couple of days, can I please get in? Uh -huh. I'll pay full price and I'll catch up. Uh -huh. And she said, okay. Oh, wow. And I still remember that. Mm -hmm. And I think that was an amazing example of playing big. Mm -hmm. Because when you play big, whether you're an entrepreneur, a, a, a nine to five employee, a parent, whatever, when you have something you want, you find a way to get it. Yeah. And to me, that was an amazing example of you being resourceful, playing big and saying, I'm not going to let a little deadline stop me. Yeah. I'm gonna find a way. Mm -hmm. And this, now we're gonna talk about how this all relates to positivity for book number one. W when I think about um, people who email me and they say like, I can't afford your programs, like what can I do? I'm like, find a way. When I was in college and I didn't have much money, there were conferences out there. I was like, I will, I'll find a way to get there. Let me volunteer just so I can be in the room and meet people. Volunteer. Get creative. Nobody's going to tell you how to do this. No one's going to turn over and say, here's like $10,000 worth of value for free. But people love resourceful people. Now, it doesn't mean you're entitled to anything, but when I get emails and when I see uh, my other friends who have businesses and people are like, hey, can you help me? Like, I can't afford this or I don't have time. And it's like, the most successful people will find a way. And books like this will show you the mindsets but most people are looking for tactics. Rami, tell me the script to use to get in late. I can give you all the scripts in the world. I'll do that too. Get my programs and get my courses and they're all there. But, or even in the book. But the larger point is how do you develop a mindset where you say, I want something and I'm gonna find a way. No barrier is gonna stop me. I think Cassie did an amazing job with that first program. Oh, thank you. Oh, and by the way, everyone, she, so I'm on her mailing list. You should sign up for it. And she's hosting uh, virtual workshops. Oh my God. Uh, like over the past few weeks. So, so if you have a um, issue where you want to become more confident or you've been playing small, mm -hmm. 
sign up, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Now I'd like to take a, a break to announce a couple of things. First of all, I'm not sponsored. I, I'm not sponsored by Hot Tamales, nor am I sponsored by anyone. And I've told you there's a, about how many brands are there in the world that I would be sponsored by? Maybe three. Yeah, I can think of two of them. One is a retail brand, uh, clothing. One is a hotel brand. Oh, two are hotel brands. One, two, Those three. Those are three. Oh, but four. Hold that back up. Hot tamales. Let's discuss why Americans hate hot tamales and have horrible taste in candy. What, is, what do you guys like to eat? Uh, oh, uh, chocolate. Give me a Snickers. Disgusting. The problem is these are so good. I think Indian people all love these. The problem is uh, the carbs are like crazy. So uh, I basically eat four and that's it. Uh, I don't know how many people know macros, but it's 27... 27 grams of carbs and there's 27 uh, that's for 16 pieces that's a lot I could eat this whole bag at once though but I'm not going to so what have we learned today number one we've learned two very important things number one positive mindset Tara Moore thinking big number two I love hot tamales and there's too many carbs in these and uh, hot tamales if you're inventing a low carb version send me an email I read every email sponsorship number five what? Oh, hot tamales. Yeah. I mean, seriously, if they offered to sponsor, would I, would I actually do it? Like, okay, by the way, let me talk about my policy on sponsorships. I, I've gotten, you know, now that I'm an Instagram influencer and all this stupid stuff, I get these horrible um, uh, offers. Hey, Ramit, post like 20 times on your Instagram stories, three feed posts, and uh, we'll send you 10 bags of popcorn. I'm like, what? Do you understand what's going on right now? 10, I'm, this is literally not a joke. Juice, I have a juice company. They're like, post five times, we'll give you a box of juice. I'm like, do you understand what these programs that we build go for? No, they don't. They're just, you know, they're bots. So, so that's an easy decision. I've told Cass, because Cass is like, oh, you know, have you considered it? I think Cass, you know the world of partnerships a lot better than I do. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't like this stuff. It feels grimy. I'd rather just create amazing programs and sell them to amazing students. That's it. So then, then I got some company that was like, come on an influencer uh, holiday to a hotel. I was like, what hotel though? And um, I just decided to pass on it. So what have we concluded? Cass, you're basically saying that I should get a partnership with a $3 bag of candy. What does that say about <laughs> your regard for my partnership abilities? It means I'm zooming in on your book. I will teach you to be rich with... Where's the hot tamales? Oh, shit. Hold on. Hot tamales. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm not doing a hot tamales partnership, but I do like the candy. Next book is Open by Andre Agassi. So I... I really liked this book. I really liked it. And I did not expect to really like it. I thought he was searingly honest. And Andre Agassi, the tennis player, he talked about how he hated playing. He hated it. But he also talked about how he was programmed to win from childhood. And I loved hearing about what he did to win and I loved hearing about success and excellence at the highest levels, but I also loved hearing about loss. There's a point in the book that I highlighted where he talks about when you lose, the locker room is deathly silent. And I love those little vignettes, those little moments where you know what it's like at the very highest levels. I've always loved that. There was, a, um, there was another example where some university wanted Hillary Clinton to come and speak there. And they, uh, Hillary Clinton's team sent a writer and all this, a writer's like a list of requirements, we need this food in the green room and all this stuff. And they were like, oh, okay, um, by the way, like this is a university, so can you give us your like student rate? And, sh and then her team replied in these emails, that is her student rate. And I was like, that's crazy. That's what happens at the highest levels of, of speaking. 
So this uh, Andre Agassi book, um, what I really loved and what I've always loved is learning what the very best do, what they go through, what they experience, how they think about winning. And uh, I remember a moment in the book where Andre Agassi talks about his, the person who uh, strings his racket. He said, basically at those levels, the strings can be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so you, you need to know that it's being done by the right person and needs to be a process in place. And I don't know about you guys, but I love that. I've always loved um, even like superhero movies or spy movies where they're the best spy. It just inspires me. Like what is the best in any field? The best janitor, the best entrepreneur. I wanna know how they think. And so I, I found this book to be amazing and eye-opening and very candid when he talks about um, his personal life and uh, his parents and, and things like that. So Open by Andre Agassi, great book. Third book uh, on positive mindset, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, uh, founder of uh, Nike. So what I love about this is three different stages. The first small scrappy, like they're handing out Nikes in Hollywood, trying to get people to wear them and then get in a movie. Um, then scaling when things get big and then when things get really hard. And this book and actually the book by the founder of Starbucks, it's just a recurring series of them getting the shit kicked out of them. Just over and over and over again. No matter what they do, something bad happens. Then worse and worse and worse. And they just keep coming back. And I really love that. It's almost maniacal. But I love that. I love reading it. It doesn't mean I have to be that maniacal. But I do love knowing what it takes and how they think. Because no barrier is going to stop them. And if you read this and suddenly being late for a webinar or not being able to figure out how to go to a conference... That is such a trivial problem. It's like, ah, oh, I'll figure that out in 10 seconds. You know, this guy had his company almost stolen from him. So I loved it. By the way, I want to tell you a story about Phil Knight that I, uh, I read in the Wall Street Journal many years ago. So there's an article called um, Stanford Mystery. Who's the old guy in the white mm -hmm. Nikes? Phil Knight, <coughs> at this point, 69 years old. People start wondering, who's this old guy in the back of this introductory creative writing seminar class at Stanford? Well, it turns out Phil Knight had been struggling to write his uh, book for 20 years. So he went to talk to this professor at Stanford, who's a very famous English professor. And he's like, hey, I need some advice. You know, I, I want to write this book. I'm struggling. So the professor said, and I quote, I suggested he start somewhere at his level of ability. <laughs> This is a billionaire. He goes, you can come to my introductory class. You got to do all the work. So this anonymous older guy comes to the class, sits there, participates every day. He's a bit like he doesn't really talk too much, but he starts taking the classmates, his classmates out for drinks in Palo Alto bars after class and he pays and then he, which he doesn't tell his classmates, he gets in his jet and flies back to Oregon. Okay, pretty cool. So I love this story, why? Because Shoe Dog is an awesome book, but it shows that even a billionaire is humble enough to go ask for help and to sit in a classroom and embrace the mind of a student. That to me is one of the most amazing skill sets anyone can have. The better you get at something, the harder it is to put yourself back in the mind of a student because you're already good and you don't want to go back and be humbled and realize you suck, but you do suck. I'm telling you right now, you suck at whatever new thing you're going to try. You're horrible. Ramit Sethi says you suck, but if you have the mind of a child and the mind of a student, you can become good. So what could be more striking than a billionaire humbling himself enough to become just another student? I just loved it. I was inspired. So I share these three books because I do believe you can change your mindset. Absolutely. I've changed mine dramatically. I think, Cass, you would say you've changed yours mm -hmm. in just the last uh, yeah. two, three years. Mm -hmm. I think these books can help. I think a larger issue, you know, we can already tell who's going to be successful or who's not. If people are saying, um, well, uh, 
I don't know, that book uh, has a couple of two-star reviews. Uh, I don't know, Ramit, uh, I trust trust you, and you made me $70,000 last year, but uh, that's got a two-star review, so I think I'm gonna keep searching for the next 15 years. Give up, it's never gonna work for you, all right? Instead, a positive mindset starts with the most simple of decisions. Should I get this book? Well, this guy I like told me to get it. Get the book! Why are you debating a $10 purchase? Just get the book! Wow. That's the mindset that gets you moving. Everyone else is sitting here agonizing over $3 questions or $10 questions. You just get the book. Oh, uh, how do, should I join this program or not? Do it! Or if you can't afford it, put on your wish list and six months from now, you'll be able to afford it. Boom. The point is start moving. What do you think I'm doing here? I could be sitting here, oh, what's gonna happen? I don't know, it's so scary. It is scary, we know that. So acknowledge reality, make a plan, and start moving. That's why I'm here right now. That's why you're here too. Okay. That didn't sound very positive, but that's me being positive. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's all I could say. I got a few questions from people, which are great questions. Thank you for these. Oh, uh, wow. What's the line between being positive and delusional? This is a great question. I think more people, uh, you're more at risk. Um, how, how do I say this? You're more at risk of doing nothing than of being delusional. So I would rather have you say, you know what? I can be good at that and then fail rather than say, uh, I don't know. Do I need to get a PhD before I start to make a hundred dollars online? No, 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 no. I would rather have you try something and fail than sit and do nothing. Um, I will say that there are some things you can do to check yourself. So for example, if you're starting a business, <clears throat> You know, one of the things we recommend is don't quit your job until you have a certain income coming in, all right? The other thing you could say is, look, I, I've always wanted to be a painter and I'm gonna really like turn this into a business. Okay, great. How much do you need for this to be sustainable? Let's say $50,000 a year, perfect. So in six months, what is a reasonable number for you to have? Okay, let's, you know, let's just pick a number. Um, let's say if we need 50K a year, in six months, we could say 25K, but I'm just starting off, so I'm gonna apply a little discount. So let's say 15K. If I have 15K, that means that things are going well, I've sold a few paintings, and I can start to increase that number. That'd be great. <clears throat> Perfect. So now you know that you need whatever that is divided by six. And so at three months, you check in. If you have 7,500, you're right on track. If you have 5K, you're fine. If you have $100, you got a problem and you need to start changing your strategies and tactics. Then you take a candid look at the end of six months. If you made $13,000, good. You're pretty much in the, in the range. You did a great job, you won. But if you made $350 in six months, end it. It's not working. And so you've given yourself six months, you've picked a number, a KPI, you've been a little flexible with yourself, but the market will tell you if you're being delusional all right. Um, how do you retain the information you read in books? So I do a couple of things. I have different levels of books that I read. Some of them are just like fun books. I don't take any notes. I just read them because they're entertaining. Fiction, although I read like two fiction books a year, but just like interesting, cool ones, whatever. The next ones are ones that I think could be interesting and I highlight certain things in them that I find interesting. I rarely go back and read them. They're just there. If I ever get the urge, I can. The third level are ones where I'm like, wow, there's really valuable information in here. So when I highlight them, I'll then take all the highlights, put them into a Google Doc, and I'll comment them to people on my team or I'll send the doc to my friends. Things like that. Like I want action items to come out of that book. That's a very high level book. And the highest level would be a book that I read every single year. And that would be a book like Breakthrough Advertising for Copy, which is so dense and rich that I discover new things in it all the time. Um, some of Jay Abraham's books, etc. Those books, I love to read them over and over and every time I discover something new. So that's how I do it. Um, you know, there's lots of other ways. You can keep a list of your biggest insights. You can create flashcards. But sometimes I'm just like pretty loose about it. Like I'm just gonna read a lot and absorb it and trust that when the time is right, I will connect what I read 
to what I see in front of me. Oh, and this is a question that I think could be helpful for me and the audience. So what do you do if you don't like a book? Do you feel the pressure to finish it? No. I'm glad you brought that up. Why do you bring that up, by the way? Because I went through this, <laughs> and I'm sure other people have gone through this. <laughs> so I've been reading since I was, I don't know, what age do kids learn to read? I don't know. Like five? All right. Maybe? Anyway, so my mom would take us on uh, Saturdays to the library, and I would check out 25 books. And what do you do in summer? Nothing. You read, well, we did. We read books. So I'd come back the next week, and I'd get my stars. There was some Pizza Hut uh, scholastic challenge, and they wouldn't believe me. Oh, you read 25 books? Let me ask you a question. I was like, ask me anything. Little did I know that 25 or 30 years later, I would be doing ask me anythings wow. on Instagram. So That's wow, right. the world is really cosmically delivered. Anyway, I've been reading for a long time. So if you've been doing anything for a long time, you build the skill, right? You're playing violin, uh, you're weightlifting, whatever. One thing that I know is that um, if a book is not good, if it's not connecting with me, I will skip, a, I'll look at the table of contents, I'll skip around, and if I'm not finding value, I'll give it 25 to 50 pages and then I'm out of there. And for me, that's relatively fast. If, if I were a slower reader, it might be 20 pages. Why? Why do I, I do it because I'm abundant. I'm abundant enough to know that I have an unlimited, endless supply of books. I also know that sometimes there are great books. I'm just not in the mood. I'm just not. I just don't, I'm not feeling reading this dense technical text. Fine, I'll come back to it. So a lot of times I'll open up my Kindle and I'll just scroll around till I feel that something is connecting with me and boom, I'll read it. So that's my answer. Mm. Um, okay, uh, what effect has positive thinking had on your income? A huge amount. I can think of a specific example. Our company was going through some tough times a few years ago and had I not built the resilience through lots of little tests, um, being positive, going to conferences when they said no, all this little stuff, it would have been devastating, okay? We went through layoffs, we went through revenue reduction, and to know that there will, that my future is bigger than my past, to know that other people have gone through worse, to know that there were people around me who could give me guidance, that was immensely helpful. And remember, this was at the time that it was so tough on myself. I was actually having trouble sleeping. I went to go see a doctor about it. And it was purely due to the stress that I was under. So I did have to learn how to manage that. But I would also say that psychologically, having that resilience and this just bench strength that I had been cultivating for a long time and an amazing team really helped. Um, I've got, um, let's see, what questions do we have tonight, Cass? Oh, so I just realized the questions from earlier pop up in this question box. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Um, keep going with your questions. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't have any other ones. <laughs> I'm just going to. Okay, let me just scroll. Talk about something. I'm not right feeling now. very positive. Right now. Talk about your love of hot tamales. When did it start? How many hot tamales do you think I can eat in one sitting? Well, we're not going to find out because. Wow. This is the worst. Sealing it up. This is the worst patter ever, ever done on uh, a live episode. If I was on the network, they'd be like, uh, "This was your last show. Uh, thanks for coming in. We won't be seeing you." We'll send your check. No need to come in again. Oh, okay. Question. Do you prefer audiobooks or a book? I prefer a physical book, but I read on Kindle now because we live in New York. And one day my dream of having a big library will be achieved. You know, I posted on Twitter yesterday, um, are people listening to audiobooks less? And I have suspected for a long time that the reason... I find audiobooks a little more challenging is that I don't have a commute. I work from home. And yes, indeed, I got like thousands of responses. M the majority of people are like, oh yeah, I'm listening to audiobooks way less because they're at home, they're stuck at home. So 
I think that you have to find something that fits into your life. Most people get fixated on what book should I buy? I mean, what's the best marketing book? I think the better question is, how do I fit it into my life? Because you can buy 20 books or you can buy 50 books. You can borrow them from the library too. But where are you gonna fit them in your life? Do you wake up in the morning? Do you read them over coffee? What about at your lunch break? That is a more interesting question than the titles. You can go just get all top five books in every category and you'll have a great start. Are most books you read recommended to you by your inner circle or do you stumble upon them? Both, more like stumbling upon them. Cause just like with travel where I read a lot of travel stuff, I like books. So I read like <laughs> that Goop article. Again, I don't usually get my book recommendations from Goop or anything for that matter. But um, unless I want to be taken advantage of by people who don't know what they're talking about. Typically I don't. Wow. Is Goop gonna sponsor me now? <laughs> Someone tag him. <laughs> like they give a shit. <laughs> Uh, so, but I find, um, you know, I'll read an excerpt of a book on the Atlantic or New York times, or it'll come across on hacker news or Reddit. I'm like, Oh, that's an interesting idea. I never thought of that Buy instantly. And, um, you know, then I'll, I'll get to it when I get to it. Um, okay. Okay. Benito. So we talked about books and we talked about positive mindset and then I started yelling at people. Did I... Talk about, are we good on positive Are you guys mindset? feeling positive? Give a thumbs up. I feel like everyone feels reprimanded tonight. <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm the happiest guy. I'm the happiest guy in this whole show because I ate seven hot tamales. It's uh, pretty quiet in the chat room. Uh, what, what do I care? I mean, look, I got a fire still going. I ate my hot tamales. One way or another, get these books. Just go buy them. Everybody will be happy. Read them. Don't read them. That's my positive message for tonight. Now. <laughs> What else can you do to be positive? Well, you can tag your friends, although I probably wouldn't recommend you tag this episode because they'll never come back. Uh, follow me, follow me on YouTube, eh, do whatever you want. I'll see you guys tomorrow night.